Well, welcome back and thank you for joining us. Um, I am thrilled today to do a kind of special uh, interview, special insofar as normally we are doing this uh, online, but I'm, I'm thrilled today to be joined by a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Nelson Klosterman. So, uh, Dr. Nelson, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Pleasure to be here. I'm glad we could do this together. Yeah. Absolutely. Nelson, uh, for those who aren't familiar with you, would you give us a little bio, background information, uh, how you've come into the field of theology specifically, that sort of thing? Yeah, I... Uh... I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which isn't too far from here, and uh, went through the entire Christian school system there, including uh, Calvin College, now university, and went on to Calvin Seminary. I was ordained in uh, within the Christian Reformed Church in 1975, and uh, <clears throat> subsequent to that, uh, I was involved in the beginning of a new seminary, first in Northwest Iowa, later it moved to Northwest Indiana, and in, in that connection, I... Uh, went on for graduate study to, to be able to teach at the seminary, Mid-America Reform Seminary. I went to the Netherlands for two years, where I uh, later obtained my doctorate in theological ethics. So I've been uh, engaged in, mostly in my writing anyway, mostly in the field of uh, theological ethics. I uh, taught at seminary level for about 26 years, and then I, I retired from that classroom and uh, f founded or began my own company called Worldview Resources International to have a more uh, global scope and range. And, uh, but I turned my work into toward translation. I became then, I worked then as a professional translator for about 15 years and uh, have been engaged in translating significant works of Abraham Kuyper and Herman Bovink and done a lot of editing of the work of Willem Auenail. I'll have occasion to refer to him later, but uh, that is a little history of my involvement and engagement in theological matters. Okay. No, and one of, one of the reasons why I think it's going to be valuable <laughs> to talk to you on here is the, the topic we were hoping to talk about was two-kingdom theology uh -huh. and all the various iterations and all the various confusions thereof. Um, and I'm going to have you kind of walk us into that conversation um, because I hope for what people hear on this as well, not not only for those who have been studying in this field, but for those who have never heard of Two Kingdoms theology, right. they're still familiar with it, I would wager we both agree on, um, whether they've heard it articulated as such or not, the implications right. are certainly there. Right. Um, and you happen to have, as opposed to many who have opinions, strong opinions on Two Kingdoms theology, you've read a lot of the Two Kingdom theology literature and in fact translated much of it. Yeah. Yeah, and I've uh, I've interacted with it in public, both in forums and in uh, journals, magazines, and uh, uh, have been. I've tried to keep my finger on the movement no uh, since it since it came into existence. This iteration of it came into existence in the in the early two thousands. Um, yeah, my uh, before I came, my my wife asked me, "Give me in one sentence what it is you're going to be talking about." <laughs> so, uh, if I may, oh, I'll yeah. share what I said. You know, and I used for her what many use, uh, NL2K, which is an abbreviation, obviously. NL stands for natural law, and 2K stands for two kingdoms, and the relationship between these two sets of initials number and initial, is that uh, the two kingdoms uh, refer to, in this new movement, um, the sacred, basically the sacred and the secular. The uh, sacred being the kingdom of God, and the secular being the common kingdom. And our dispute is going to arise in connection with uh, how these two are related, how these two kingdoms, so to speak, are governed, directed, and how they come into expression for the Christian. Um, the NL part, natural law, um, is the reference to what is governing the uh, common kingdom, the secular kingdom, the non-church, non non-Christian arena of life like the state, education, business, politics, the whole bit, and that, that, that stuff. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to think of a good way. Maybe you can just direct us. What's the best way to walk into NL2K specifically? Is it, um, is it the NL that's driving the 2K? Is it the 2K driving the NL? Uh, how do we define those terms? Because I think, you know, for most people you're thinking, and again, I'm trying to think of maybe the people who might watch this that have not read in, much of the scholarly mm -hmm. literature. You say two kingdoms, and they think, okay, I might have heard something like that from Augustine. I think Luther spoke of that. It seems like maybe I've heard Calvin. There, there's different conceptions of two spheres, two kingdoms, two realms right. to some extent. 
I think for many that 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 kind of blurs together into one amalgamation. Mm -hmm. um, how do we walk into that? There, there's also I, I would point out there's been some some recent back and forth on natural law, natural theology. We could say natural revelation and all mm -hmm. the differences and variances thereof. Right. Right. But yeah. How do, how do we walk into that? Well, first of all, um, I think it's important to understand that in this entire discussion, uh, words, phrases, and theological terms are being used that have a long, long history and long pedigree. The problem is they are put in, they're being put in service to a different system mm. of thinking. For example, Augustine had no problem conceiving of the world as two something. He used the phrase two cities, right. but two kingdoms fits with that too, because you've got the kingdom of Jesus Christ or the kingdom of God on the one hand, and the kingdom of evil, the kingdom of Satan. So you have the city of God, the city of, of Satan the city of the world. And for Augustine, these two were uh, antithetical in every regard. They were hostile toward each other. And the, the tradition, the Christian tradition, whether now Protestant, Roman Catholic, evangelical, has sort of always adopted that and spoke of that, that, you know, the rule, the, the reign and realm of Jesus Christ is opposed to the reign and realm of the devil, of mm -hmm. Satan in the world. Now, of course, Luther picks this up in the Reformation, and he spoke of two kingdoms. But what a lot of people forget about or don't observe is that when it came to working this out in his writing, Luther preferred to speak of two regiments, mm -hmm. two regiments or two regimes. And uh, he also uh, distinguished between God's right hand and God's left hand, that God rules his people, his kingdom by his right hand through the spirit and through the word, through the Bible and so on. But God also rules with his left hand, and that's where the power of the sword is at work. That's where the, uh, the state functions as, as an instrument. But, but bear in mind that for Luther, as for Calvin, um, the state was always a minister of God serving righteousness and therefore under the dictates of God's word, mm. um, albeit in, in, in a different way than, than the church is. You see, in the church, the authority of Jesus Christ through his word and through the, the officers, the leaders in the church, is exercised as a ministerial authority, a ministerial uh, kind of service to God's people. In the world, uh, it is imperial in the sense that in the world, God's authority is used to punish people. It's used to uh, uh, reward good to those who do good and reward evil to those who do evil. And uh, it, it operates with different kinds of uh, restraints and restrictions than the church operates with. It has its own restrictions, the church does, in terms of sacraments and ordinances and things like that. Um, Today, however, today, however, these two areas, these two realms, these two kingdoms are hermetically sealed from each other in the sense that um, you, cannot, you cannot lay claim to the state using the Bible. You cannot lay claim to the behavior of uh, business or education or other kinds of activities out there in the world by using Scripture using the Bible to dictate and direct activities. The scripture operates in the church. Natural law operates outside the church. And by the way, here again, we have differing uh, constellations or constructions here. Some would put the family in with the church such that there can be a Christian family operating under the dictates of God's word. But others would say, no, 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 you can't have a Christian family. You can only have individuals in a family who are Christian. Um, in either case, in any case, I should say, um, in the one realm, the Bible operates or special revelation. In the other realm, the uh, natural revelation or natural law operates. Okay, so is this, is this a fair conception then, if we were to think of things like the state, then this 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 conception of natural law two kingdoms or NL2K would say that the state exists outside of the dictates of God's word. So God's word given for his people within, let's say, the church sphere or the church yes. authority. Mm -hmm. And then NL2K would say then the state is not beholden to those things. That's is that right. is that at all? Or like is there any is there any sort of wiggle room on that? Because just thinking to some of the conversations we've had right now, 
Um, and, and that might be too broad of a question, but walk me into it. Some of the conversations right now are looking around, for example, at, at countries and saying how ought laws be passed, how ought societies be structured, um, should God's word function as a guide, rule of faith, rule of practice for the government? Is NL2K kind of a hard a hard line between those two? I think the NL2K is a hard line between those two. Okay. So that, let's take the issue, for example, of, of abortion. Um, uh, a, a solid, what I would call integrative approach, and I use that term to describe people like Augustine, uh, Kuyper, to a certain extent Luther, but most of the Reformed tradition has an integrative approach where they talk, they speak of the equity of God's word, the equity of God's laws that can be brought to apply to the civic, civil life of a nation. Mm. So with regard to the abortion question, we all agree and understand that simply placarding a Bible verse in the halls of Congress is not an effective way to produce legislation in, in today's culture. But there can be certainly appeals, indirect or direct, appeals in the making of legislation to the image of God, to the principle of justice for the vulnerable and the weak, and to other Bible-based, Bible-fueled, and Bible-generated uh, principles of civic life and public activity. I think there must be, on the part of Christians, uh, a kind of appeal to these things. Mm. So why, why the pushback then from, from those who would, would adhere to an NL2K <laughs> approach? Number one, why the pushback? Where are they grounding this concept of natural law? But then secondly, I'm very <laughs> curious about the, um, I want to use charitable language as best as possible, but the sort of co-opting of various historical figures that don't necessarily seem to be on that, on that uh, perspective, and yet they're, you know, Luther, Calvin, Augustine, these are all being made to serve that, that perspective. How, how has yeah. that occurred? Well, it has occurred, in my opinion, um, through reliance on the exegesis of a pretty important figure in the background of this new movement, this NL2K movement, a uh, figure like Meredith Klein. Now, I'm not going to go too much into his, his exegetical program. Uh, people can read that on their own. But the outcome of his exegetical program is that he's very strongly asserting a common realm, and this common realm is, um, uh, according to him, and then later David Van Drunen, who is significantly affected by Meredith Klein, is, is grounded in the so-called so -called Noahic Covenant. Mm -hmm. I think both Meredith Klein and I know David Van Drunen alleges that the no Noahic Covenant is a non-redemptive covenant. It is the covenant whereby God established the common territory ruled by common grace, where Humanity, uh, society in common, shares goals, objectives, and, uh, and life together. It is not special grace that rules there. It is not redemptive in any sense of the word. Now, I, I vigorously demur from that construal. Um, I think that historically it can be shown that um, people like Calvin and people like uh, Abram Kuyper, for example, viewed the uh, Noahic covenant as a redemptive covenant given by God to preserve the church in history, in the world, for the sake of the coming Christ. Mm. So the, the rootage of this NL2K uh, movement, ideology, one might say, uh, lies strongly in that construction of the Noahic covenant, that it is non-redemptive, it is secular, it is establishing a common realm, and uh, and I would I would disagree with that. So so that's kind of where you get some of the conceptions of of sacred versus secular, or common versus holy. Right. Those those sort of bifurcations or divides within society. This is within the the realm of the sphere or, or the realm or sphere we could say of the church or of the sacred or the holy. That you know whether it be school, government, etc. That's within the common realm. Yeah. Profane. Mm -hmm. Okay. Profane. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you lose with that conception? I mean, you, obviously, you've, you've written on this before. You've engaged with, with NL2K advocates. Um, and I'm also kind of curious, there's been a, a, another 
uh, descriptor used oftentimes, which is R2K or radical two kingdom mm -hmm. theology. I'm curious your thoughts on that. But in general, just thinking toward the application thereof, if somebody's listening to this again and this is a new conversation to them, what do you lose exactly with this conception of the common kingdom or the common realm or the common mm -hmm. space? Well, uh, now this is going to get a bit technical and a bit deep theologically because I have... Um, written and i have asserted and alleged that the fundamental basic problem is a christological problem okay it's in your doctrine of christ i can point you to uh quotations and citations for example where one of the advocates of nl2k uh speaks about christ as logos asarkos and logos ensarkos and it is Christ as Logos Asarkos who exercises his rule, whatever that be, in the common profane realm. That would be Christ, the word without flesh, the word unfleshed, the word by which the world was created, let us say, the Logos by which the world was created. On the other hand, you have the Logos en Sarkos, which is Jesus incarnate, Christ mm -hmm. incarnate. And he rules by means of his redemptive word, so I, I would suggest that we've got a problem here with Christology, that we have a divided Christ who functions in ways that are disparate, that are separate from one another. And I think you, you end up with a kind of duality that threatens to become a dualism mm. in, in Christology itself. So okay. you ask, what do we lose? That's, that's a theological premise. That's a theological thing, argument. I think from uh, you know for the person on the street, what they lose is the confidence of being able to speak as Christians, self-identify as Christians uh, in the public in the public square, in the public sphere. Take for example in education. Um, there's a strong tradition in Reformed uh, history of Christian education, Christian schools. These are not schools that were born and built to rescue children from the awful public school, all of the aberrations and all of the human uh, things that we want to avoid. Christian schools were born from a fetical, that is a positive worldview mm. that Jesus Christ in his word stipulates certain things, principles, ideas, uh, viewpoints that ought to obtain in the classroom, okay. that ought to obtain in uh, between parents and children, that Christian schools are functioning in loco parentis. The, in, this debate that we're having today about whether teachers ought to honor the parents in terms of the children's sexual identity, I, I would submit to you that could never arise, should never arise within a Christian school setting because the christian school functions in loco parentis as an extension of the home and that's why parents ought to be involved in engaged in supervising governing the christian school in a very active very active proactive way mm. what do you lose with the nl2k uh philosophy or ideology you lose what i think is the authority of christ's claim on all of life, particularly in areas of morality and, um, and in the areas of, of uh, human identity. I think today that the church is facing something that may be somewhat new in terms of its interaction with the world and even interaction inside with itself, that heresies today Ten, they can be, of course, uh, theological heresies. But I think we're being confronted more and more within the church by moral or ethical heresies. Mm. And this is a result, I think, of sectioning off the claims of Jesus Christ for uh, public life, for educational life, business life, identity, sexual identity, and so forth. Mm. I hope that makes sense. No, it makes it makes a lot of sense. And no need to apologize, by the way, for anything being too deep, because this is a video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if anybody has any issue, they can pause and yeah. uh, go look up any sources. But it's interesting. Yeah. You used a term um, that I find quite interesting. You referred to something as Christian um, that, that is outside the individual believer or the church. 
is that part of this this issue? Because you referred to Christian schools. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking that that descriptor might apply to other things outside of this. Let me just ask it plainly. If you are within a NL2K uh, approach, perspective, paradigm, whatever you want to frame that as, can you speak of anything as Christian outside of the gathered people of God? I would allege that if they're consistent with their her- their principles and their statements and their hermeneutic, you cannot. Okay. And I challenged them on that very point. When I wrote a, quite an extensive review of a book by Professor Daryl Hart, who teaches at Hillsdale College, a book entitled Secular Faith, and I think in that review, one of the claims I made was if, if he's right, if he's right on the separation of of church and state as he delimits it, if he's right, you can, we can close our Christian schools because there is no such thing. Mm. Um, the folks became very, very nervous with that kind of um, observation and uh, chose to defend. Yeah, we like Christian schools because, you know, the, the, the morality is better in Christian schools. In my opinion, that's not an argument for Christian education right. uh, because our children are are better better behaved and given better discipline in the Christian schools. Again, I don't think those are good reasons. So my answer to your question is, I think defenders of NL2K cannot, and in most instances do not speak of Christian, even Christian families. I've pressed on this point. I've pressed very hard on this point. Can't, how can we? given your premises, given your arguments, how can we speak of a Christian family anymore? But def- definitely not Christian schools. Christian political party, as as I'm familiar with them, given my history and ancestry in the Netherlands, there is such a thing as a Christian political party. Mm. Several of them. Several of them. And, uh, you know, Christian business organizations. In Canada, they have a Christian labor union, which operates according to different principles than a non-Christian labor union right. would do. So, well, let me let me ask you this because I know we want to get into, or at least I want to get into uh, some Kuiper and some Awaniel, like you were mentioning a minute ago. But what makes something Christian then? How how could one refer to, you know, somebody's watching this and they're thinking to themselves, you know, well, what does make a Christian family? And maybe that one's a little easier to define, but to something like a Christian school, other than it just being statedly, which I would suspect for most of us at least within American culture, it's the fact that it has Christian on the sign, right? It, <laughs> yeah. it, it, this is the Christian school of such and such, that, that therefore that is a Christian school. I'm not going to hear cursing in the hallways from teachers, that sort of thing, maybe. What, what makes something Christian? Well, let's, let's take a Christian school. I think that's a valid and a good, uh, uh, you know, a good test case for this entire discussion. Um, a Christian school doesn't teach math in a, in a th- there isn't a uniquely Christian equation that makes two and two equal four. But in the teaching of math, it is suffused. It is suffused with the recognition and the confession and the declaration of uh, that our God is a God of order. Mm. And this God has ordered the universe in some pretty magnificent ways, which when we're doing math ought to lead us really to worship. Mm. Now that that's a very broad and a very tough to get your fingers on kind of defense of Christian education, but I would submit that the te- Christian teaching of history, the Christian teaching of mathematics, the Christian teaching of literature does does business with the Bible's teaching about the image of God in humanity. It does, does business with the Bible's teaching about mercy, compassion, justice, redemption, how much literature how much English literature in lit class doesn't deal with stories of redemption, mm. stories of failure, stories of forgiveness, stories of sin? You see, in 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 my opinion, in in state schools, all this verbiage that I just used is is heavily religious and therefore may not be used in the classroom. You've got to teach it in a different way. Right. So, perhaps it's that last word that I used that characterizes what makes a Christian school Christian. It's the way things are done. Right. The way things are done. It's, it's interesting. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a simple man, so I like simple illustrations. And in, uh, in Alan Hill's book, um, which you either edited or translated? I edited. Edited. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. 
So um, in that book, he had this this simple little running. I say it's simple, it's it's profound, and yet it's just very simply illustrated that if one is a carpenter, you know, at some point one is going to reflect on carpentry under the reign and rule of God and think to oneself, how might I swing a hammer in a way that pleases Christ? And is there instruction from his word in which way? And before you know it, you're going to develop an ethic, a uh, Christian ethic of how one might be a carpenter. Mm -hmm. um, I, and then he goes through you know various trades, various segments of society in this illustration. I thought that was just brilliant because then you can start to conceptualize, okay, there can be Christian things outside of the regular preaching and teaching of God's word within a worship service mm -hmm. as, as good and indispensable as such a thing is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, why, do you want to walk us into a little bit of, of Alan L's critique or um well I I want I do want to refer to uh, a couple of sources that I use quite a bit one yeah. is John frame's book I think John frame wrote a, an excellent book entitled uh, uh, the Escondido or Escondido theology a reformed response to two kingdom mm -hmm. theology mm -hmm. um, I think that's an excellent uh, analysis of what goes on. And John, by the way, is very, very f intimately familiar with this entire movement because he used to teach at Westminster in California. Okay, yeah. And uh, and he knows the players. Mm -hmm. He knows them very personally. Um, Owenale's book is, is a book that deals with um, not only uh, the kingdoms and the, the, the matter of... Uh, the theological pedigree of this discussion, but he goes into philosophy, a lot, quite a bit of philosophy. Yes. And he is committed to uh, the Christian philosophy. There we go again. Right. The Christian philosophy of a man named Herman Doivert. Owenale is a man with th three doctoral degrees, one in biology, one in theology, and one in philosophy. And in philosophy, he wrote his dissertation on Doivert's view of his anthropology, I think, Im Imago Dei. Mm. And uh, so there's, you get a lot of bang in the for your buck in this book of William Owenale. So it, it's tough to summarize uh, his book. Yeah, there's a lot in there's there. There's a lot in it, yeah. but he, he is very clear and very ex explicit, as you say, very down to earth with his illustrations about societal relationships that are under the dominion of Jesus Christ, under the dominion of God's authority and, and that word. Now, because he studied philosophy, particularly Dora reading philosophy, he also recognizes the function of the creation order, the created order, so that we don't turn to the Bible for answers to all questions. Uh, you've heard it said, I'm sure, I don't like it, the statement, because of often its context. The Bible is not a scientific textbook. Mm. I always want to know what comes next mm. after that sentence. Yeah. So I agree the Bible is not a scientific textbook, so what? <laughs> it's not going to teach you how to do surgery. Right. I grant you that. <laughs> um, it's not going to teach you how to build a bridge. I grant you that. And this is where the critics of a Kuyperian, neo-Calvinist system with grins on their face often uh, poke fun. Mm. Show me a Christian bridge. You know, Show me a, a Christian dental implant. Uh, well, that's really to hold up to mockery the, the entire position. Um, when I said a while ago with regard to Christian education, perhaps one of the key entrance points is the mode, the way we do things. So the way we conduct our business, the way we treat our employees, the way we set up our, um, our intake and outflow of raw materials, uh, the manufacturing and the end product, is, is a way that is conscious at every point of uh, human personality, human need, humanity. I don't know that, uh, I, don't, I, I would think that a Christian businessman busy with manufacturing could not be satisfied simply with sticking somebody on an assembly line to push a button eight hours a day. Mm. Would recognize that as being less than human and fulfilling less than one's human potential and would try to offer some kind of solution to that, that problem, that dilemma. That's an example of the modus or the way that Christianity operates in the workplace. Okay. See? Yeah. So you mentioned, you mentioned Kuiper and I've already mentioned him at least once. So um, we're dealing with Alan Eel, at least at, at present, you mentioned Doiveard. Um, how does Kuiper play into this whole conversation, this stream of thought? Because, as as we've seen, many have 
and again, I'm trying to be charitable with the language, many have seen Kuiper uh, quite friendly with conceptions of NL2K as, as if Kuiperianism um, matches quite well with this conception of NL2K. Right. I have my suspicions that's not the case. Well, um, how do we I, walk into that? Yeah, I will not be as uh, ironic as you <laughs> because I speak of theological kidnapping. Okay. I say that advocates of NL2K, and I've written this uh, and demonstrated this as well, that they have uh, they have kidnapped Herman Bovink and Abram Kuyper. In part, this is my estimation, in part because they don't read Dutch. Hmm. And so there are things that Kuyper and Bovink have written that ha that at the point that this movement got off the ground and at the point that they began appealing to Kuiper and Bobbing, at that point weren't translated. The NL2K movement getting off the ground. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. When NL2K was getting off the ground, Pro Rega wasn't around in English. Mm -hmm. Now it is. Right. When it was getting off the ground, Bobbing's uh, essay on the kingdom of God had not yet been translated. Now it is. Mm -hmm. So there are so many of these works, including Kuiper's Common Grace, three volumes, Pro Rega, three volumes, and so forth, that are now in English, which people can check for themselves to discover that uh, these, these men don't at all sound like NL2K advocates. Um, I, I have the privilege of being able to understand and have translated quite a bit of Dutch, and when I read and heard that these theologians were being invoked in service to NL2, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Mm. I thought they haven't read the stuff because they did. They read the stuff in, that was available in English. Mm. Now, um, I, I think you mentioned Abram Kuyper. See, Abram Kuyper is the guy. He's the man of sphere sovereignty. Sphere sovereignty basically means that God has created society with various realms or spheres of authority, and he has demarcated these as, in a, in a sense, in a way that says, leave each other alone to do your work. So the family should not interfere with the church, should not, and in fact, this is, in my opinion, part of the problem with some uh, contemporary movements among Christians where uh, I'll say it rather crassly, daddy does the work of the church. Daddy right. baptizes, daddy administers the Lord's Supper, and so on. And that's somewhat of an anti-church movement. Now, Kuyper recognized and taught that the church has its sphere, and its sphere is demarcated from that of the family. And that the, the, the state has its sphere of authority and rule. But at no point in Kuyper's setting out these spheres did he... Uh, did he remove any one of them from under the claims of God's word, under the claims of Jesus Christ? As a matter of fact, in my teaching, you know this because I shared this with you and with the congregation here. I have a diagram that offers, uh, to put this in, in diagrammatic form, that the Bible is the center of life and the custodian, the custodian of the Bible, not the owner, is the church. And the church in its preaching addresses that word of which it is the custodian, addresses that word to all of life, to all these various spheres, so that the pulpit ought to be capable of speaking to business, mm. speaking to the state, speaking to family. It has to do so carefully. It has to do so textually. It has to do so uh, pastorally, ministerially. Uh, we do not, we do not fire employees of a particular businessman in our congregation. The church does not do that. Right. The church does not um, swear into office certain judges or police officers. That That's the job of the state, et cetera, et cetera. But under no condition did, did Kuiper exempt any sphere from being under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, as you know, his famous dictum is there is no, there's not even a square inch. There's no square inch of reality about which Christ does not say, this is mine, mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing. Um, more importantly, I think, is Kuiper's teaching, and he was lauded for this, uh, that there is no such thing as neutrality. Yeah. There's no such thing as religious neutrality. When, when many people talk about the separation of church and state, 
I can understand a sphere sovereignty argument for that kind of proverb, that kind of maxim. I would use a differentiation rather than separation right. yep. of church and state. But what most people think about, though, and mean is the separation of the state from religion. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's totally impossible. Or from Christ. Or from Christ. Yeah. yeah. But we need to come to grips with the fact uh, that, as you were fond of saying in your preaching, that everybody worships somebody, and you cannot not worship, mm -hmm. and therefore you will either be worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, or you will be worshiping someone, something other than him. Mm -hmm. And that is what the Bible means by idolatry. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's interesting with Kuiper, because, you know, you're mentioning the translations, and, and many of us encountered Kuiper, you know, early on in seminary with uh, lectures on Calvinism, yes. right? That was kind of the mm -hmm. introductory text for me. And then you get a little deeper in, and, and for example, during 2020, um, during the Troubles, with a capital T on both, you know, um, during the troubles of 2020, many people were enc encountering sphere sovereignty for the first time. And yeah. that was a tremendous blessing, I think, and a retrieval of some good uh, Protestant, I don't know if I'd frame it as political theory, but at least it, it, judging for how to deal with these these various issues within the the, the world. Um, what's interesting is reading Pro Rega um, in the English, which has been available 2018, 2016, right. something like something that. Like that. Uh, recently, but still several years out. I have it in Logos, so you know it's nicely laid out in digital format. But reading through that, as you said, um, any conception that removes one of those spheres from the just visceral lordship of Christ, I, I, any given chapter seems like a proof text within Pro Rega for that. So it's, right. it's very interesting to, to hear those conceptions as as sort of groundwork that Kyperian sphere sovereignty can somehow be employed to a sacred secular uh, division. Yeah, I don't understand how that can happen, and that's why I'm so uh, agitated and and invigorated, really, to oppose this mm. um, as doing injustice to Kuiper and Bavink. Yeah. By the way, you mentioned you mentioned one blessing of the COVID era. Of uh, being the discovery, say, of sphere sovereignty with right. regard to the church. I am so thankful for that era in terms also of what it has done for education. Okay. Because it has oh, yeah, it yeah. has alerted parents to the reality, uh, the blessed reality that they can do it. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's a tremendous rise in homeschooling. There's a tremendous rise in alternative education yeah. that... Um, that the parents need not hand over their children to the so-called experts on these things. Mm -hmm. And that, in my opinion, is a, is a blessing uh, uh, coming out of the COVID era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so walk us into, I see you've got, you've got two up here, McElhaney, Duma, Dauma. I yes. always mispronounce them, so help me with that. But okay. um, walk us walk us into a little bit of that literature, if you would. Well, um, I participated um, in this volume called Kingdoms Apart. Note the title, Kingdoms Apart, Engaging the Two Kingdoms Perspective. And this is edited by Ryan McElhaney, who, who back then was a professor at Providence Christian College in uh, Pasadena, California. My contribution, again, is the translation of two essays. Um, one, <clears throat> um, well, first of all, my, my uh, speech, my presentation to in a conference in Grand Rapids with David Van Drunen in attendance entitled Natural Law and the Two Kingdoms in the Thought of Herman Bavink mm. is printed in this book. But there was an address entitled Christ and the Magistrate and Church and State by S.G. de Graff. Now, this is, these addresses were spoken in public on the eve of the invasion of the Netherlands by Germany during Second World War. And these two addresses um, went a long way to identifying the evil of National Socialism and the evil of... of um, capitulating to this um, idolatry of the state. Right. And um, I, I translated them because of their historical relevance and a demonstration that no 2K, NL2K theology or ideology would have served the Dutch during the Second World War. If my father himself was a member of the uh, Dutch resistance, 
during the Second World War, and he was very heavily influenced by Abram Kuyper. And uh, he and his comrades, they continued to swear allegiance to the queen, mm -hmm. who was in exile in, uh, in England. And uh, I would submit to you that uh, no resistance of that quality and of that caliber would have been mounted with an NL2K ideology. Okay. Um, one of my theological mentors, heroes, is Klaus Skilder, who continued to write uh, after the Germans had uh, invaded the Netherlands, continued to write against the National Socialism. And he was, he was imprisoned for a time because of that and had to go in hiding for the duration of the war. But in my opinion, that was a courageous demonstration of a Kuyperian worldview uh, in the teeth of and in the face of the brutal uh, invasion and occupation of the Germans mm -hmm. of the Netherlands. And um, I consider that heroic. So, okay, so this this might be a little off topic. I hope it's not. But you, you bring up the volume from McElhaney, which I found a really engaging read, too. You get these different chapters that mm -hmm. are sort of laid out in, in, in essay format. It's always engaging to read one of those. But you mentioned with the rise of national socialism, Nazi Germany invading. That's a compelling picture for most, right? We, we think of World War II. We think of the stark contrast oftentimes of good, evil, um, and the horrors that, that Nazi Germany was bringing. Let me let me let me let me try to frame this in the in the, the frame of the conversation. What what is the danger with saying that that is the responsibility or realm or sphere of individual Christians only, and not of of the church as such? And I ask that because one of the primary contentions that I've heard from many who seem to be, and again, I'm I'm being overly ironic and charitable with this, right? But who seem to be within the NL2K uh, sphere seems to be that we as Christians may or even must have uh, political convictions, we must stand against evil, we must vote in the voting booth, we must do Christianly things in society. Um, so maybe I as a Christian must stand against Nazi Germany. However, as it was a political movement, the church as such, and I'm using those two words intentionally, mu uh, must not and indeed cannot stand against such things in society. How do we encounter that, especially with the, the myriad challenges that we face in our own culture? Well, um, I don't know enough about the history to speak authoritatively, but it strikes me that the entire confessing church movement in Germany during the Second World War, and don't forget, Germany was heavily influenced by Lutheranism, mm -hmm. and some would, some would blame the evolution, the development and unfolding of National Socialism in Germany. Some would blame the Lutheran Church for this, particularly in terms of the two-kingdom idea. Mm. I don't share that kind of accusation at all. Um, moreover, you look at people like Bart and Bonhoeffer, who resisted uh, and, and led the resistance within the confessing church itself. So there you have an example in history of that kind of opposition, which of course, as we know, cost Bonhoeffer his life right. and uh, many, many other Christians as well. Uh, the, I don't disagree with the claim that Christians as individuals need to resist evil at every turn and do so Christianly wherever that evil manifests itself. What I object to is the prohibition by NL2K that this obtain organizational form and institutional form uh, among Christians who band together to do the same, to do it together as right. well. I, I object to that that stricture, that restriction. Of the of Christians <laughs> as the church, as such, opposing evil, right. as, as the, the group polity. Right. I, right. I wonder, is this, I mean, no, go ahead. By the way, yeah, I, yeah. I, I wanna be clear, I wanna show you something here, if I may from Belgic Confession, Article 36, because this this was a, a bone of contention in the Netherlands uh, during Abram Kuyper's lifetime. In fact, he was instrumental in getting uh, Article 36 of the Belgic Confession, uh, written in 1561, Guido de Bray, uh, getting this, uh, this particular sentence eliminated from Article 36, which required the state to in a sense, uh, eradicate false religion. And that was uh, a bridge too far for Abram Kuyper. Okay, and and the advocates of NL2K that I've heard within the Reformed tradition who appeal to this 
say, look, see, 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 even Kuiper agrees with us. But I want to read to you the words of Article 36 that are still left, left over, okay? We believe that because of the depravity of mankind, our gracious God has ordained kings, princes, and civil officers. No problem. Mm. He wants the world to be governed by laws and statutes in order that the lawlessness of men be restrained and that everything be conducted among them in good order. So far, so good. Both, both of us can agree on that one. For that purpose, namely that the, law, that, the, that the society be governed by laws and statutes, for that purpose, he has placed the sword in the hand of the government to punish wrongdoers and to protect those who do what is good. That's straight Romans 13 teaching. Their task of restraining and sustaining is not limited to the public order, but includes the protection of the church and its ministry. In order that the kingdom of Christ may come, the word of the gospel may be preached everywhere, and God may be honored and served by everyone as he requires in his word. Mm. I submit to you that Article 36, as it remains post Kuiper after his deletion, etc., still obligates the government to honor the authority of Jesus Christ in preserving the church, seeing to it that the word of the gospel may be preached everywhere and God may be honored and served by everyone. Mm. I don't understand what's unclear about this yeah. with regard to the calling of the state to honor God and see that everyone else does too. Right. Okay. Yeah, no no sacred secular divide, right. it doesn't seem at that right. point. So there again, I think that the advocates of the reformed advocates of NL2K who claim to subscribe to this uh, are misunderstanding and misinterpreting and misapplying this very article. And mm. and they're hiding behind Abram Kuyper's deletion of that bridge too far, namely that we exterminate and eradicate false religions. Right. To suggest that see, we don't want the government involved there. Right. Okay. How does Dalma play into this conversation? I well, see you've got, yeah, I got have, him pulled up. You know, I, I've been a translator for a, a long number of years, and part of my burden is to discover books that are in Dutch that yet need to be translated. Mm. And I have a couple. I'm so busy with other things, though, that they I never get around to it. This is one of those books. It's in a series uh, in, uh, entitled Ethische Bezinning, Ethical Reflection in which Dalma wrote about politika verantwoordelijkheid, political responsibility. And in this book, he has a chapter on Augustine. He has a chapter on Luther, where he very, very kindly clarifies the difference between uh, two Reichen, or Reichen, to use the German term, and two regiments. And it was the regiments that Luther defended and that Luther promoted. Um, and then he goes on to Kuiper, and he concludes with uh, pol politics today, and then civil disobedience and civil uh, resistance. So this book needs to be translated only for, if not uh, for its historical clarity, and to uh, set clear where Calvin and where Luther and where Augustine really stood in this whole matter of uh, Christianity and politics. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've been helped a lot by this book myself. Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder, just with an eye toward sort of summarizing some of these these views, so we can we can admit that for most of us, you know, reading, you know, Augustine's Two Cities is challenging, at least if you if you have to read the unabridged version in seminary, as we all had to do. Um, reading reading some of these, as you intimated, reading through Kuiper or reading through uh, Bob Inc., um, there are those who will challenge interpretations of those, those. So some of the literature can be a bit challenging. I'm wondering what some of those primary dangers are of NL2K, um, because I think that's that's where a lot, maybe a lot of the discussions seem to surface in, in the fact that this is not some sort of esoteric or ethereal or just philosophical debate we're having um, as if what Luther thought of the two kingdoms actually is what, what drives the world. But instead, there's very real practical worked out implications of this, not, not only in the way we think about the world, not only in the way we reason from scripture, but also how we live our lives. What are some of the, maybe uh, the big red flags or the big dangers that you see within the modern NL2K movement? Well, um, 
I'll, I'll turn your I'll answer your question by turning it around a little bit mm -hmm. and become a little bit of a preacher. Um, you know, in the last number of years, I have heard numerous cries on the part of Christian parents that we have got to get in get into the school boards of our public schools and we got to take over. We've got to retake, reclaim, reconquer the territory of public school education. I get very upset by those cries because I don't believe that's what the Bible calls us to do. The Bible calls us as Christian parents to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And that raising and nurture of children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, it is a, is a whole life, 24-7, 365 project. And I don't see it as legitimate for Christians to hand that off to anybody other than those who will do the parents' express desires mm. for teaching, for curriculum, for content, for morality, for ethics, and so on. And I, I invite such parents who, who lift the cry to go back into the school, to public school to reclaim it, to, I, I, I like to ask them, why waste your time? Why not, with your children, with whom you have only one chance, why not spend that time with your children cultivating that Christian worldview, nurturing and building that Christian worldview so that when they go to university and they go to uh, in, into the workforce and they get into adult life, they, they have a worldview that helps them position and place things in their lives in light of God's word at every turn. Mm -hmm. They know how to understand the news. They know how to listen, to read. They know how to understand technology. They know how to understand their own emotions. They know, how to, they know how to understand their own sexuality and all of these things in the light of and with the help of God's Word. So that's a very concrete uh, example of, I think, the divergence between a worldview Christianity, as I would like to call it, and which Daryl Hart enjoys to mock. He continues to mock this worldview Christianity versus uh, a sacred-secular divide, mm. so that when you're in the world, <clears throat> you're, not, you're not really under Christ in the sense that you speak, declare, and, and, uh, and uh, instantiate His will, His Word, for whatever area you're, you're working in. Okay. So that, that, I hope that's concrete enough, yeah, yeah. clear enough. Well, I think the Christian schools is a good and a helpful illustration because, like you pointed out, that's that's something that most of us were, were very familiar and comfortable speaking in the categories of Christian schools, mm -hmm. whether they be homeschool or, or formal Christian education elsewhere. So I think it's a good example to use. I can give you another example, uh, and this is, again, very... Uh, I, I, I've read about and studied the Christian Labor Union in Canada, mm. and you might say, well, Christian Labor Union, what's this about? Well, we here in America about the UAW, and we hear about the Federa American Federation of Teachers and all of this. And, and the, the problem with these unions as we experience them in America is that they are built on and based on the, the principle of adversarial relationship, mm. that management and labor will never meet. They'll never see eye to eye. They'll never co-operate. They are always at odds, and one is trying to take advantage of the other, and so forth, and the opposite. Well, a Christian labor union doesn't begin at that point, and it doesn't operate with that premise. It doesn't function in an adversarial relationship, but rather as a, as a uh, collaborative effort between management and labor who, have, who share common goals, common ends. Mm. And, uh, and that makes the mode of interaction between labor and management uh, completely different. Right. Completely different. That's another concrete example. See, and and I wish, uh, I wish the Christian Labor Association in Canada, uh, the Lord's blessing as they continue to uh, demonstrate and illustrate and exhibit this kind of different mode. I wish we could have it here in America too. Okay. So th there was one thing, and this is a little bit out of order, but it was earlier. Well, specifically when we we're talking about Alan Neal's book. Um, Joe Boot um, from the Ezra Institute wrote mm -hmm. the forward. And in fact, was Ezra? Yeah, Ezra Press published that as well. 
Um, so sometimes with with some of that uh, line of thinking, you get the labels of one kingdom versus two kingdom theology. Um, mm. I've seen that differentiation. I don't know if you had any thoughts or critiques on that. Um, some sometimes the one kingdom label seems a bit of a misnomer um, toward that perspective. I don't know what is meant by one okay. kingdom. Uh, if if people are suggesting that uh, opponents of NL2K reject natural law, that's simply not true. Mm. Um, may I read another? Absolutely. Okay. My my perspective on natural law has been shaped by Canons of Dort, chapter 3, 4, paragraph 4. You know, it says, To be sure there is left in man after the fall some light of nature, whereby he retains some notions about God, about natural things, and about the difference between what is honorable and shameful, and shows some regard for virtue and outward order. So non-Christians stay married, mm. for example. Non-Christians raise children, for example. But listen, so far is he from arriving, that, that is the unregenerate man, led by natural light. So far is he from arriving at the saving knowledge of God and true conversion through the light of nature, that he does not even use it properly in natural and civil matters. Rather, whatever this light may, may be, man wholly pollutes it in various ways and suppresses it by his wickedness. In other words, the typical classic Calvinist Reformed understanding of this is that natural law, natural revelation, has to be read through the prism, through the light, through the spectacles, to use Calvin's analogy, of special revelation. That, that is such a given in Reformed biblical teaching that it shocks me when I hear Reformed men, like advocates of NL2K, say, well, that goes for the church. That goes for the church. That doesn't go for the world. Where, where does this come from? We've always taught that there are two books, so to speak, Belgic Confession, Article 1, the book of nature and the book of scripture. But the Belgic and Calvin have always said the book of nature must be read through the light of the book of special revelation, the book of scripture. Mm. So that, as you know, Cornelius Ventil said that the unbeliever cannot truly know truth right see right okay um i don't know how i got onto that <laughs> no no well i was coming right back to natural law because i mm -hmm. think for for a lot of people they would they would think you know we can look out in nature and we can understand things their mind might go to romans one but i don't think they're looking through those lenses of two books one interpreting the other by necessity because therein we have God's word then giving us the interpretation of what we find elsewhere, mm -hmm. which again, bucks against any bifurcation of sacred and secular spheres. Right. Um, what topics are we missing on this? Anything you want to wrap up with on this this topic of two kingdoms in general, but uh, the NL2K particularly? Well, I, I think we're, we're, we're heading into some very, very serious ethical, moral questions and dilemmas. I don't know if you read or heard about last week, they allegedly uh, created a human being I saw without yep. the use of a sperm or ovum or a uterus. And they did so with, a, with stem cells. And uh, okay, I understand. I see what's being attempted here. But the, the question is going to become and well, actually, it is already today. What does it mean to be human? Right. What does it mean to be human? And I would submit you cannot answer that question simply on the basis of natural law, mm. on the basis of nature, genetics, whatever. That you you need a a pusto, a place to stand which transcends nature, and that is given us in special revelation. Mm where we are taught and told that we are not, uh, we are not uh, simply uh, particles that have evolved accidentally and randomly within the universe, but we have been created specially by God to look like him and to be, to be like him. Mm -hmm. You can't get that out of, out of creation. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one where this is going to, where this goes. I, I think loyalty and allegiance to NL2K is going to just, put tape over our mouths right. on this. What's a good jumping off point then for somebody? Because 
I know we didn't mention Klein a lot, but especially Klein's theology is enduringly popular. NL2K in general has a popularity. Um, some of the names you just mentioned. Wh where would somebody jump into this conversation? Uh, maybe as some some foundational steps toward understanding some of the flaws with NL2K, some hmm. of the challenges with NL2K. Where would they jump into this this sort of stream of thought? Well, I, I think I think you owe it to yourself to read Meredith Klein's Kingdom Prologue which sets out his entire exegetical structure from Genesis 1 onward, mm. but particularly with regard to his views of a common profane realm versus the sacred cultic, cultic realm. Okay. I think you owe it to yourself to read Meredith Klein. And then, and then I think there are some books and writings of David Van Drunen that, that give flesh to Klein's exegetical structure in this entire debate of natural law, it's now taken to the next step. If Klein took us to first base, Van Drunen is taking us to second base. Mm. But I think in terms of, of uh, evaluating it, I think uh, Awanel's book is probably uh, as, good as, uh, as good as any to use to start. And of course, uh, you'll have to specify which one because he's written oh, about four thousand. Oh so yeah, yeah, to, it's yes. a, a book a week of almost. <laughs> the world is Christ. Yep. A king, a critique of two kingdoms theology. Perfect. Yeah, but also uh, John Frame's book Escondido Theology goes. John John has written uh, a lot of material, as you know, an entire systematic theology, and John is very accessible. His material is very accessible, and it's very. Uh, very p pious, I don't want to say pietistic, pious in the sense of uh, leading you to God, mm. leading you to worship in, in terms of how he unfolds the teaching of Scripture. So I think John's book is, is a good book to use, too. Perfect. Yeah, and I know, I think one of the challenges, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems that a lot of, uh, well, just to say it, Frankly, David Van Drunen's written a, a lot, at least several volumes, and it seems that some of his latter theology is perhaps trying to clarify some of his earlier theology. Yeah. So um, one would almost have to say maybe read the latest volume from Van Drunen as well. Yeah, I suppose. Okay. I suppose. I, I quite agree with you. I find some shifting going on, particularly with regard to Christology. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, well, Dr. Closeman, where are you? Uh, where are you active? Can people keep up with you anywhere? Are you? Uh, are you sending out tweets? And well, you're on the Facebook. I'm so, on uh, Facebook. I'm on Facebook. I also have a blog. I I I so, write so infrequently. I can't. What is the name of that? Cosmic Eye. Okay. There Cosmic you. Eye. I think it's a blog that I have. We could put a link in the notes. Yeah. For that. Yeah. Um, Facebook. Those are my two main. I'm on Twitter, but. I don't enjoy Twitter as Nobody much. Nobody enjoys Twitter anymore, no. so you're in good company. No. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I would also invite you to look up my uh, my author page on Amazon. There you go. Yeah, because yeah. there are a lot of my uh, writings have appeared there. Um, I've written a number of Bible studies that are still in use today, published by Reformed Fellowship. Um, and... Uh, and as I say, I've translated a number of works. Yeah. Particularly, I, I highly recommend Dalma. Mm. Dalma's book, The Ten Commandments, Manual for the Christian Life, is a, is a bestseller. It's and on one of these uh, shelves some, somewhere. Yeah, here, his yeah. book entitled, uh, <clears throat> he's, he's got a book on, on uh, the introduction to Christian ethics as well. Uh, kind of a, a paperback, small uh, I can't think of the title right now, but forgive me for that. Um, sure, sure. You have a copy of it, I know. Yep, I do. But maybe you can insert that. Yeah, we'll put we'll put some links to all these in the, yeah. the notes. But I think yeah. I think this is a really responsible conduct. Responsible. Right? That's it. Yep. yep. So, yeah, that's on that shelf over there. Okay. So okay. yeah, it's nearby. Okay. No, I think I think this is a this is a really I I think this is a very important uh, conversation for a variety of reasons. Number one, a recent, it seems, uptick in NL2K perspectives. Number two, as you said, a mounting uh, array of challenges, which NL2K I do not think will address nor give us footing nor grounding to respond to them, other than, as you said, with a closed mouth. Um, and, and for the, again, many people who watch this uh, channel may not be deep into the literature, deep into right. the philosophy thereof, but they're encountering these challenges in their everyday walk. We've right. spoken about things like Christian schools. We've spoken about, you know, legal measures being done by our government, genetic research, 
th this is, I think, where it hits home for the Christians. So I think it's a worthwhile conversation to keep and, having. And people need to keep in mind that that the pulpit, the pulpit shapes people, mm. and the pulpit is called as well to inform their lives in these other areas. That's not the same as to direct their lives mm -hmm. in these other areas, but it is to inform them with the light of Scripture and the principles of Scripture and say, hey, when you're out there, think about this. Be mm. careful about that and notice that. Yep. that that's where I, I think I'm very, very keen on emphasizing the priority of Scripture, of course, priority of Scripture. And so any involvement with this ought not to take us away from the Scriptures and its clear teachings on these things. But secondly, the primacy of the church, mm -hmm. the church as the, as the people of God entrusted by God with the ordinances, the means of grace, for their nurture for living in the world as god's children yep no well dr closeman thank you so much we might have to do a follow-up but thank you so much for joining me this has Welcome. been this has been a blast as always <laughs> thank you it's like breakfast isn't it that's right <laughs> just with no food no thank you so much sir you're welcome here at my right hand the Lord.